just gonna shamelessly plug my course because I think you guys are gonna be registering for classes soon. Um, you guys can see my screen. And just wanted to do a plug for the course that I created last year was, or last semester was the first semester and it went pretty well. Um, and it's a course for both undergraduate and graduate students. Uh, so if you guys are physics majors, or even if you're, and I know you, it's physics majors, engineering physics majors in this course, but also we had chemists, biomedical engineers, polymer scientists, material scientists. So it's a pretty diverse course of people who enroll. Um, but similar to this course, it focuses on instrumentation. Different from this course, I, I personally think it, it focuses on cooler instrumentation used in biophysics. Um, so if you have a biophysics specialization or you need some electives for your major, um, this might be a course to consider. Um, and if you can't take it this coming fall, it'll probably be offered the fall after. Um, so as a senior, that can be an option as well. Um, so if you have more questions or want to learn more about this course, feel free to reach out uh, about that. Um, but we can get started with the lecture of today, which is focusing on the lock and amplifier. And that's gonna be the focus of lab five completely. And this is an instrument that you haven't used in lab yet. Uh, there's a little uh, photo of it here and we keep them in a closet and you'll be able to take them out and use them for the next three weeks. Uh, they're quite larger, bulkier instrumentation. So that's why it's not in your lab station. We're only using it for one lab, which is the other reason. Um, but uh, a lock and amplifier is a way to detect very uh, weak signals. We'll be going over how it does that um, mathematically and also what you would expect to see on this instrument. Um, but because it's so sensitive, it's used in um, many different applications and in the upper level labs, you'll be using it quite a bit as well. Uh, but to orient you with lab five, I do wanna note that um, part one, again, is a MATLAB simulation to orient you of like what the output means and to see what's going in and out of it. Um, the second part is build your own lock-in. Uh, so doing some circuits construction, um, to build the components and uh, go piece by piece to understand what electronic components are behind the commercial instrument. So seeing how it works. Um, and then the third part is using the commercial instrument, which I've shown here, Stanford Research Systems 510. And we'll be going, that's what SR stands for, um, Stanford Research 510. We'll go over that in more detail. So using that uh, commercially. And then the fourth part, I debated going back and forth between having an application of the lock-in in the lab, but it was quite involved with some of the circuit components as well. So to have ensure that both lab partners can be engaged and involved in the fourth part, um, you'll be watching a YouTube video of a breakdown of doing two experiments and answering some questions um, about that. So that's what I decided. If you're an in-lab person and want to get your hands dirty a little bit more with the lock and amplifier, I can give you the information for that other experiment that I had planned. Um, but given this semester and the hybrid aspect, that's why I deferred to um, the breakdown of some experiments. Um, but they're, they're cool experiments of measuring the speed of sound and also measuring um, the photoelectric effect. So, I think there are some nice applications in that video and it's really well done um, by someone else. So just with this breakdown, parts two and three are done in lab, that should be the focus. Um, and if you want, I, I would also recommend you can do the MATLAB portion to start as well. So just to orient you what you'll be doing in lab number five of it. Um, so, for this lecture, what we'll be going over and what are some key components that you'll need to know for the lab and the quiz coming up. Um, first, what is this instrument? Why are you using it? As opposed to all the equipment that you've been using so far in lab. Um, 
We'll be going over the different electric components and what the purpose of those electrical components are to do some math on your signal um, to achieve the sensitive detection uh, with the lock and amplifier. We'll go into a little bit more de details of the mathematical principles between, behind how lock and amplifiers can detect frequency differences and also phase differences. So there's two different aspects there. So we'll go over the details of those. And also the lock and amplifier acts as a very high quality bandpass filter. So we'll be going over in a little bit more detail of the, uh, quantifying the quality factor, just like you did with the bandpass filter, but for the lock and amplifier instead. Um, so we'll start with uses of lock and amplifiers, like I mentioned, um, very sensitive. And I'll be using the abbreviation LIA for lock and amplifier. That's what's used in the lab, just like we're using like DSO for digital oscilloscope um, and the like. That's a acronym that we'll be using. Um, so lock and amplifier is based on if you're sensing frequencies, if you're sensing phases, how you're using the lock and amplifier can be used um, as an analogy and be used as a very sensitive detector for different electrical signals. So one is being a very sensitive uh, AC voltmeter. So instead of using your KDM, KDMM or MDMM, and it can work like the full scale range that it will work over ranges from something like volts, which you could detect on your DMMs, um, but down to nanovolts as well. So if you have very weak signals, you'll have to use the lock, the lock and amplifier can achieve that. Um, can also be used as a phase meter. Um, you can really precisely compare the phases of two signals. I guess accurately and precisely. Precisely meaning to 0 0.00 whatever degrees there, um, thinking of that. You can use it as a spectrum analyzer. So if you're using it for looking at the frequency responses, it can very accurately achieve that. And as I kind of alluded to on the previous outline, um, it can be a super high quality bandpass filter. So just by pushing a button, you can get quality factors that are orders of magnitude better than what you can get with a um, LCR filter. So actually, I think I kept that animation there. Yeah. So. This plot should look familiar over here where we have our uh, power spectrum and decibels versus our frequency um, on a log scale over here. And we have our noise spectrum that we see here. So uh, as a brief refresher, this offset from here to here is going to be your white noise that's due to thermal and shot noise. We have some peaks that are due to the environment. And then we also have our flicker noise, our one over S noise over here at low frequencies. So um, if we're trying to measure a very narrow band, that's what the lock and amplifier is good at. It's having a very narrow bandwidth here. And based on, again, your center frequency that you have in your band, you can get your quality factor from that. So we'll go over those details um, of how good of a key value that you can get uh, when you use a lock and amplifier as a bandpass filter. And similar, we, or relatedly, uh, for noise measurements, you can get your full uh, frequency response of the system. Since noise, sources of noise can also be, they're not always 
high, they can be somewhat low uh, levels. You can the sense using this as a sensitive voltmeter and also a spectrum analyzer, you can characterize sources of noise or your noise and quantify that uh, using the lock and amplifier. Um, something to note. Um, something to note with the Stanford Research System. So this is the front panel here. Um, and something I'll probably reiterate multiple times, well, reiterate in this lecture and also in the lab is seeing the entire scale that a lock and amplifier can work over. It can get down to nanovolts here. Um, so this panel sets your sensitivity of your lock and amplifier. And you can see over here, um, these are different units. So it starts at 500, goes down to one, and then you can be in the volt range, millivolts or nanovolt range. So this is where you're setting your sensitivity. And also the dynamic reserve over here has to be, is related to the dynamic range. Um, so um, around that sensitivity, how, how large of voltage range can, is it responsive to? And we discussed that a bit last lecture about the how you quantify the dynamic range. So this is the panel that you'll be using to select like what range of signals that you're looking at. And it's very, very important to have this at the correct setting over here. If you don't, if you're, if you have this set up to detect nanovolt signals and you're providing a volt, something on the order of volts, you're going to damage this instrument. So it's very important to double check that to not overload. That's what the status over here is indicating. Um, there's a light over here that says overload, and that will tell you if you're overloading your instrument, if you're providing too high of a voltage or a current and damaging the instrument. And if that light goes off, you want to remove the source right away. So don't. this isn't an instrument that you want to play around with blindly because you can damage it. You should, you can play around with it, but do it in an informed way, knowing that you won't break uh, the setup. Um, so when I'm saying that you can set the sensitivity over here, these black buttons right here, if you hit them up or this would be up or down, that will move this lit up area. Say you wanna work at like 20 millivolts, you would hit this black button down here to push this down and move this light until it's 20 volts, 20, and then this button over here uh, to get down to millivolts or so. Um, so something to note over there. So this is here, the units will tell you how you're using the lock and amplifier, if you're using it as a voltmeter, a phase meter, spectrum analyzer and the like, that here with the sensitivity, with the voltages, um, that's one way over here in this panel, you can change the phase. And that would be if you're interested, of course, in using this as a phase meter. And we'll go over these panels um, in more detail later in the lecture. Uh, so any questions in some of the uses? This very general introduction. It'll become more clear as we go through how this lock and amplifier works. Um, and there's going to be three components, electrical components that are necessary for the lock and amplifier to work. The first one is that you're going to be comparing your signal of interest, and that has to be an AC signal to a reference signal. So I guess this is like 1A, this is 1B, that you need to have your signal of interest and also a second signal, a reference signal. And you need to be working with an AC signal, uh, let's see, did I include that? You need to be working with an AC signal because one, the reference signal is always an AC signal. And you're trying to look at the differences between these. That's what the lock-in is very sensitive to, the differences between your input and your reference. And if you have something that's DC, there's not gonna be any changes going on. There can also be drift of that DC signal and also can be more uh, sensitive to noise as well if there's some frequency dependence on your noise there. So if you have something that is DC, it has to be converted to an AC signal. So 
one way to do that, um, I think we discussed this a little bit, you can do that electronically. Um, if you're working with optics or with a laser, this is a chopper wheel. And in the YouTube video that you'll be watching some experiments um, being done, they use a chopper wheel to modulate um, um, a light signal from a diode. So then it's an AC signal. So that's one way to do that with an optical signal. With an electronic signal, you might have to use a summing circuit like you've used in the past where you feed in a DC signal with a known AC signal. In the same way like this chopper wheel, you know that how the frequency that you're modulating your input there. So we're going to write these two. The first thing that's needed in lock and amplifier is your input AC signal. We're going to write that as sinusoidal function with some amplitude A, some frequency omega 1 T with some phase phi there. So we'll say this is 1A. Another thing, so we'll feed that in and we'll also be feeding in a reference A signal, reference uh, signal, which is what I'm saying is 1B. And the reference AC signal is usually um, a sinusoidal function or a square wave traditionally. And we're going to say that it's at this known frequency omega 2. And we'll just write it as sine omega 2 times t. We're here the important thing is going to be the frequency of that omega 2 of the reference. So that's what we're starting with. What the lock-in then does is it multiplies it multiplies the input signal with the reference signal. And this multiplier, um, when you're in the second part of lab five, you're going to be using an AD633 op amp to multiply those. Or if you're in the commercial lock and amplifier, there's a multiplier built in and you can go into the details of the circuitry um, as well. And this multiplier step is also um, sometimes called a mixer or a demodulator. Those are some other terms for this uh, component of the lock and amplifier. Um, so this is the second thing that's needed is you need to multiply those two signals. So with what we wrote out as the functions of our input and our reference signal, we can then write this as A sine omega 1 T plus phi times sine omega 2 times T. So that's our multiplier there. And we're going to use um, a trig identity. I'm going to put it over in the corner over here. When you multiply these signals based on this, if you have two sine functions, sine of A, times sine of B. This can also be written as one half cosine A minus B minus one half cosine A plus B. So based on this trig identity, we can also write this out as A over two times cosine omega 1 minus omega 2 times t plus our phase minus a over 2 cosine omega 1 minus omega 2 omega omega 1 plus omega 2 sorry about that times t plus our phase information there so using this trig identity is then important in the next step, the next important component that is in uh, the lock and amplifier. Next important component is having an integrator. And do you guys remember from the filters lab, you had to answer a question, um, what type of filter acts as an integrator? Filter. Yeah. 
So I hear some people saying low pass filter. Dina puts low pass filter in the chat. So yeah, the integrator will be a form of a low pass filter. And we can sketch out the frequency response function of the low pass filter. So we can put this on a dB scale, a log scale, and it'll look something like this on the log scale. And that how this integrator will work, you want to pick off the cutoff frequency. So if we have our cutoff frequency here, um, where it falls off by that three decibels, you want to select your integrator. So the cutoff frequency, if you look at our expression after the multiplication, we want to pick that off that we keep this lower frequency component over here. So we'll call this the omega one minus omega two while rejecting our higher frequency component, omega one plus omega two. So in this equation here, selecting your low pass filter time constant or cutoff frequency. So you keep this and you reject the second term. And if you collect that time constant correctly, this will, what will happen is when omega one is approximately equal to omega two. So when you're using your lock and amplifier um, to look at the frequency of your signal, if these frequencies are locked in or if they're matching, what you'll get, if this is much less than your cutoff over there, what you'll, Get as a result, this will be approximately zero. And what your output will be is A over two time cosine of your phase information, which will be a DC output or a DC result here. While this term, this higher frequency uh, term, uh, will be rejected or removed. So the only time that you'll get a signal out if you select that time constant correctly is when your frequencies are matched there or locked in. So after this step, you'll have some DC signal. And if our integrator is the third component that you need, I guess the fourth component, eh, I guess it's kind of optional, but is usually included in there, is that you, um, in many lock and amplifiers is you have a DC amplifier. So if you're looking at relatively weak voltages, like when we discussed uh, getting down to nanovolts, having a DC amplifier present means that you can actually like detect that signal. You can detect that low voltage output which, um, and that's your result in the lock and amplifier is a DC output. I'll star this and put a little happy face that you only get this when your signal and reference are locked. Hence, hence the term lock and amplifier, having your frequencies match means they're locked in together uh, and can get an output signal uh, from your lock and amplifier. So if I ask you what components are needed for a lock and amplifier, the important things are having an input and a reference signal, multiplying those together, and then integrating them with the appropriate time constant to get a DC output signal. And that DC output can be amplified optionally uh, depending on that, uh, the weakness of your signal. So any questions with the components of the lock and amplifier or how these trig properties and your low pass filter lead to the lock in aspect. Okay. So we'll move on to also how the lock and amplifier can be used um, to detect the phases of signals. So we're going to start with that same multiplied uh, input signal, reference signal, and the trig identity. I'm just going to rewrite that out from the previous slide. 
Let's These and pluses should not look so similar. I'm sorry for that. Um, we have our input, our reference, multiply it together, use the trick identity. Let's put this in terms of cosines. So if we have a case where um, our signal and our reference are locked in, if the frequencies are matching, what we're left with is then A over two cosine times cosine of five minus A over two so if we add these two together, if they're matching, we can approximate this as two times um, the frequency times t plus the phi there. Uh, I forgot to include. I really don't know how to erase on this thing. If I hit undo, it won't let me. So bear with me. So that's what we would be left with if we're locked in here. We said already that then we can ignore this second term if we select our, lo our long pass filter, um, our low pass filter correctly. So we can just focus on A over two time, times cosine of five. So knowing how, the values of cosine, if we just focus on cosine and phi here, if phi is equal to zero degrees or 180 degrees, we'll get a value out. So, like that's where the cosine is the maximum value at zero or 180 degrees, you'll get something out. But if the phase between your two signals is 90 degrees, what you'll get is attenuation, you'll get nothing out since cosine 90 degrees equals zero there. So this is how the lock and amplifier can then act as since phase differences between your input and your reference there. So how we've written this, we're just fixing the phase of uh, the reference signal to zero. And if relative to the phase of your reference, if they're 90 degrees out of phase, if your signal is, if your input signal is 90 degrees shifted from that, you'll get nothing out versus if it's in phase or 180 degrees out of phase. So these are the trait. This is the math behind how it acts as a phase sensitive detection. So I have some sketches here. I have some plots here uh, to show some differences. And uh, here we have our different signals. And I have shifted these with different offsets. You can see just like when you guys were making your um, lab. Working in origin, shifting those off by some arbitrary offsets. That's what we have. So here, our reference signal we're using is a square wave, could also be a sine wave. Um, and we're providing that we know that reference signal there. We then provide an input signal that's a sine wave. It's completely, it has the exact same frequency and the exact same phase. So you can see that these are lined up here. We're gonna multiply these together. So here we have positive times a positive, negative times a negative, so on and so forth based on this, that then our output here would all be, have a positive voltage as well. So that's the multiplication step in the lock and amplifier. The next step is then doing the integration. 
where I said with that low pass filter <clears throat> that selecting that integral value is very important. So it's very important to average over many cycles of your signal, of your reference. Here, since these are locked in, we're averaging over many cycles of the input and then also the output of the multiplication. So here, I'm showing this gray box. That means we're going to integrate over all of this, take the sum, and we'll end up with the time average signal as the output. So in the lock and amplifier, I think I have a sketch here, selecting this value for your low for your uh, low pass filter is all written in terms of the time constant here. So you can see that these are the different values. You can go from 300 to one. Here they indicate seconds or milliseconds. And for some reason, Stanford Research Systems uses a capital S or this for milliseconds, but realize that the S stands for seconds, different than the accepted um, units that should be used. Um, and you can choose this to range from one millisecond to over 100 seconds is the range of time constants that you can use for your um, low pass filter. So in this case, if we choose a time constant that averages over many of this, like I chose some arbitrary time value here, um, you will get then get your DC signal as the output. So on this display here, let's say like um, for the time average or BRMS is 0 0.354. The output is displayed either as an analog. So you would see this as a positive, like this needle would go to the positive side, some value. You could also see the output on this digital display here as a somewhat constant. Uh, positive value, or you can also take the output here and feed it into DSO or your KDMM and read what that output is. Um, and you should also realize that this output will be proportional to um, the magnitude of your input. Where this alpha here is indicating proportional to. I mean, I guess that's a technically a different signal. So if you double the amplitude of your input signal, then this needle would move twice as high over here. If you half it, um, it'll move to half the value there. So this is measuring like the locked in um, frequency response here. Um, we can also see the locked in frequency response, but also being sensitive to phase. So if we shift our input signal, so it's 180 degrees out of the phase compared to what we had on the previous slide, what would you expect to see change in your output after the multiplier step? You Go ahead. I was just going to say it'll be negative. Yeah. So what you would see is similar shape, but just flipped over the y-axis over here. So you'd have a negative output here. So that seeing that you have a negative signal as your output would be indicative of the phase shift. Or you could shift your reference phase, the phase of your reference, and see um, if you see that switch from positive to negative and get some information that you have a locked-in frequency to your reference, but also that you have that phase shift there. So some of the sensitivity as well. Then uh, for another example, let's say we keep the same frequency. Now we have the 90 degree degrees phase shift. So we're going to get a different looking uh, output signal over here. So uh, not sinusoidal, but what you can see is because of this 90 degree phase shift, what we have is this is symmetric around the y axis. So we have equal contributions of positive and negative. And if we're taking the integral, if we're averaging over many cycles over here, 
what that output would then be is zero. Um, so again, um, it's important to average over many periods. And after you do that, you will get your output of zero um, based on that uh, lock, the lock and amplifier here. So here, what the lock and amplifier is acting as is a phase sensitive detector. Or you'll also see this referred to acronym PSD for phase sensitive detection. Um, so this is showing that the lock-in will only respond, it will only have a DC output when your input in, is in phase or 180 degrees shifted in phase with the reference. But if it's 90 degrees, you'll have something else. <clears throat> the last example I want to show is the frequency dependence here, that if you have something that your reference and your input signal are slightly different frequencies, can you sense that? Um, so here we have something that's a reference signal. You can see over what I have plotted here that there's 10 cycles. The input signal has 11 cycles. So very small difference. If you're visually looking at this, you might not quite notice it. You can see I've traced a certain number of periods that they're um, not lining up at all. So if we multiply these two together, we get something quite funky. Um, it starts over here where we have mostly positive signal. Then we get something that looks similar to the last uh, slide where when things were 90 degrees out of phase, then it shifts mostly to negative and back to positive or so. So this is an example where it's showing that it's very important to select your low, uh, your lo low pass filter correctly. Because if you don't, uh, you'll actually get something that will falsely tell you that these have um, the same frequency. So like, So if I average over, let's say this, the entire time that I have pictured here, the output would give you the zero value showing that it's uh, okay. But let's say if I just average over, let's say, uh, <clears throat> about a period or so or two periods, then what I would see is I would see after I integrate over this amount of time, I would see a positive value. Then I would see the needle shift to zero after I average over, I guess, this section here. Then I would see it start to shift to negative, negative, and then it would be oscillating back and forth. And you'll see that on the display of uh, the lock and amplifier. If things aren't locked in, the telltale sign with that analog output is you'll see it oscillate back and forth there. Um, <clears throat> and this is really closely tied um, to when we talked about Fourier's trick. So we said that over a single period, if you have two sinusoidal functions, If you integrate over an entire period, what you would get is one versus zero, depending on if m, it's one if the frequencies are matched, if m equals n, but you'll get zero if they're not matched. Uh, who knows what I'm writing here? <laughs> that the frequencies, um, need to match there. Um, so if they aren't matched, what you're going to get is an AC output. That's why I'm saying where that needle is, um, which is pointing to that your frequencies aren't matched or you have the wrong time constant based on what you're trying, you're interested in quantifying. Um, so to give you another example of this, different than this plot here. Something else we can also look at is like, let's say we're comparing a 100 Hertz versus a 1001 Hertz uh, signals. 
So basically what I'm showing here is we have to average over, let's say, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Like if we actually want to get a zero output, our time constant would have to be something around five periods here. But if we were comparing 1000 versus 1000 and one hertz, um, the period would be equal to one millisecond and they would come in and out of phase approximately every one second there or one hertz since the difference between these is one hertz. So if we chose a low pass filter where the time constant is much greater than one second, what that would mean is that our output would be zero. <laughs> Similar to here, if we chose a time constant that's much longer than five, five periods, we would get that output of zero. But if we chose a, a low pass filter where the time constant is approximately one second or less than one second, you would actually see that AC output instead. So depending on how large, if you want to quantify what the phase difference is between these, the time constant of your low pass filter can give you input on what that frequency difference is between those two. So any questions with these plots that I showed? I also described two more things to go over. Um, the quality factor of the lock and amplifier, how it can be used as a bandpass filter. So I wanna go back to um, that 1000 Hertz versus 1001 Hertz example there. So we're gonna remember that our quality factor is gonna be, um, and I think I wrote it, Earlier in the slide, I can't, I think I wrote it correctly here. Um, <clears throat> quality factor is going to be your center frequency over the band of frequencies, and that's going to be dictated by the tau on your um, low pass filter there. So for our example of 1000 versus 1001 hertz, we're going to say that we're going to fix our time constant to one second there. And that's going to let us distinguish a one hertz difference out of 1,000 hertz. <clears throat> Do I have that flipped? No. OK. So that's it. setting our time constant to that means that we can detect one hertz um, out of that 1,000 hertz. So then with our Q, we can then put this in as 1000 Hertz versus our band one Hertz, which gives us a quality factor of a thousand here for our lock and amplifier. And if you compare this to what the example that I gave you with the LCR in lab three, I think the quality factor there was, I think it was about seven or so. Um, is what we were aiming for. Um, and I think it ended up being worse than that. And if you tried really hard, you could probably get to something around 50. Versus with the lock and amplifier here, I just gave you a quick example of achieving a quality factor of 1,000, but you can easily get up to 100,000 or even better if you're using like one of the top of the line uh, lock and amplifiers. Um, if you're using it in a bandpass filter type application. So clearly that's much better. And it's also much easier. The difference is it's much more expensive compared to using um, electrical components to make a bandpass filter that costs a couple pennies or so. So it's a cost, it's something where you have to weigh the cost here, um, but if you're really looking for small frequency differences in signals, you can get great measurements over here. <clears throat>
Um, so any questions with the Q value for lock and amplifiers? Okay. So I do wanna go over um, the specific lock and amplifier that you'll be using in lab for the next couple of weeks. Um, we went over a little bit of the panels of the sensitivity and the like. So up here at the top, that's the front of the lock and amplifier. Down here is the back of the lock and amplifier. And it's important that I'm showing you the back because you actually need to use it. Um, so first area that I wanna point out is the reference. So one thing on the front of this panel, you can see they break it up into different areas and they have different titles on the top. And over here is where you provide your reference signal. So you actually provide the reference signal um, to your lock and amplifier. And uh, this is what you'll be multiplying versus your input, which is over here. So one nice thing with these lock and amplifiers is they provide a reference if you want to use the lock and amplifiers itself as a reference. And that's what these uh, BNC junctions are over here, that you can feed the built-in lock reference signal to the front of your panel here. So it is a little bit, it, one, it's nice that they provide you a reference that's built in that you can use. That's nice. It's not as nice that they put it in the back and you have to connect it to the front. So the engineers um, in the course, you can think about that as like, is that good design or not? Um, but you, you will be using this built-in reference in the lab. So you make that connection from the back panel to the front, just with a coax junction between those BNCs. You can also fine tune the reference if you want uh, with uh, th this panel here. Um, these are trim pots and I think you have to use a screwdriver to then adjust those if you wanna fine tune it. You can also take this reference connected to your DSO or your KDMM and measure what the reference is um, if you would like there. So that's the first area that I wanna point out. Um, you can also see that you can change the shape of the reference. You can also change the phase of the reference and shift that. So that's one component. And one of the things that's necessary for the lock and amplifier is having a reference signal. Second panel I wanna point out is over here with the signal inputs that you can provide different voltage inputs. That's what A, B, or a current input, that's what the I indicates here. So the switch you can select if you want A, if you want A minus B, or if you want a current input. So it can do a little bit of math between these signals itself as well. So this is where you would provide your signal input. So we have our reference and our signal. That's one component that you need for your lock and amplifier to work. Then um, we already discussed this a bit, uh, that you can control the sensitivity, sensitivity, knowing what range that your signal falls into. That's how you would select what sensitivity that you would set this at. And knowing if you're damaging it, again, is in the status indicator, you can see that OVLD, I think is overload. Right now it's highlighted unlock, um, different component, different notifications uh, over in this panel here. <clears throat> Before you multiply your signal and reference together, there's also this panel over here that does a little bit of, um, you can decide if you want to filter your signal before it goes through that multiplication with the reference. So these are some built-in, you can see this is like a band pass or other filters if you'd like to clean up your signal before you multiply it times the built-in reference. And the last area then is what I discussed a little bit already, is this is your output. I guess these are the units for the output. You have this analog and uh, display of the output. And then the reason that they keep, you might think it's a little weird that they keep an analog output, but that the difference between having a DC output versus an AC output is what is telling you if it's locked in or not. And seeing this needle stay in one location, if it's DC versus AC, if you're using a very long time constant, it might still not be locked in and you'll see this drift very slowly. So tomorrow, I hope that if you get to using the commercial instrument tomorrow in the lab, in lab partners, 
I really like to you guys to show that AC um, or show this analog output to your remote lab partners and showing that. So that's easier to see that it's oscillating and that's AC versus sometimes looking at the numbers on the digital display um, where you might be like, is it AC or is it just drifting? Is it noise? That's a little harder to tell. And then also, of course, it can be easier to see also on the output with the, if you wanna put it on your DSO and display that as well. Um, so that's what any question with the instrument at all. And it'll be much easier to do so once you're in the lab um, or your lab partners in the lab and pushing buttons or and you're you can help with the manual as well. Any questions with this? You may have already mentioned it, but is there a difference between the two built-in outputs on the back? Yeah, so I think this says like X6 and X5. And it might be the overall amplitude of those, I believe. Um, and that's something to check in the manual as well. And also, um, I did want to point out all the electronics, page 28 of the manual, um, show all of these, show all the electrical components of the different filters that you can use. So up here, this bandpass filter or notch filters, that's what these buttons are doing up here. You can see. With the output, there's that DC gain, the low pass filters for the integrating, the multiplier, these are all in the manual and the manual will likely, the manual will tell you the difference between these. And I'm guessing it's, maybe you're trying to use this to compare different signals at different frequencies. You can quickly change between these two um, if these outputs, these outputs have different uh, signals there. So also worth noting is, here, this DCO range, I think this button, this area over here um, has to do with the frequency and the amplitude is how you can tune those. Other questions with the instrument? Okay, so that's what I had to cover today. I do wanna to point out, take some time to look at the manual, be helpful. It also is a great resource. So I wanna note if you haven't looked at the syllabus in a while, but there's no lecture next week. If I gave a lecture, I'd just be recapping this. And I wanna point out that if you wanna hear me spiel about this again, um, and probably in a slightly different way, uh, the lecture from uh, covering the lock and amplifier from last year is up and um, it has quite a few views and I've gotten comments from scientists at other locations like postdoc and a research group sending me a note saying like, oh, that was a nice breakdown that I would recommend that if you want to stay fresh on this and for next week's lecture or in the manual, there's a description of the lock in technique um, that breaks this down that that's what I would point you to. Um, uh, take a look at those re resources, those references in lieu of uh, lecture next week. Um, so I'll stop sharing.